So um, this session's observing, and the start is because everyone agrees that we start with the soil. Um, soil, plant, animal, man, uh, biodiversity, where it all starts with the soil. I think all farmers who are here, all farmers who um, are uh, organic or ecological, and even increasingly conventional farmers would say looking after the soil is, um, is hugely important. So, so we start with how we can observe changes in soil or health in soil. And some of this is as part of an overview, some of the things are what farmers can do uh, to observe and to influence health. So functions of a healthy soil. Um, the whole range of uh, functions, some would be recognisable conventionally, others may not be. And it comes back to the idea of the health of soil, plant, animal, man. Yves Balfour's idea uh, of one and indivisibility, and that's inherent in the idea of health, and therefore health of the soil is also inherent uh, in that. But how do we actually measure, look at, assess, evaluate soil health? And the... Um, range of parameters that um, we consider and the values of healthy soil, clearly some obvious ones, physical structuring of plants, nutrient supply to plants, the role that plays, influence in, on plants and animal health, and the obvious ones in terms of nutrition and so on, and provision of some things, but some somehow less obvious, um, because overall nutrition coming from the soil means the soil actually has to act as a medium. It is a mechanism from transfer. Soil processes have got, have got to make this material available. And particularly if you start with uh, organic, an organic system where you're not putting soluble nutrients, you're not putting soluble fertilizers, and you're not in general putting soluble minerals into, or uh, you are putting some minerals, I shouldn't over, overstate that, you are putting some minerals into the soil sometimes. But the activity of the soil has got to make those available and make it available in a balanced way. One of the big problems with conventional agriculture is not necessarily the toxic effect of fertilizers, but it's the unbalancing effect. So particularly soluble nitrogen creates massive imbalances. It screws up, screws up the provision, it screws up the speed at which, um, at which nutrients are moved around. And in some cases, it forces a plant to take up soluble nutrients. Almost a plant has no choice. When it does that, particularly if it takes up an unbalanced amount rapidly, you get major changes in cell structure of the plant, you get major changes in accumulation of things like nitrate, for example, which in some cases, particularly in vegetables, in periods of low light intensity, vegetables forced to take up soluble nitrogen, they can't do anything with it, the light's wrong. So they store it, in which case you get high nitrate vegetable. Some vegetables, you need high nitrate, but lettuce certainly, you don't. You don't need that. It's bad. It's not a good thing. But in those situations, soluble fertilizer with low light levels and with the wrong kind of variety, um, they're forced to take it up. So you get unbalanced nutrition and therefore unbalanced, uh, unbalanced um, uh, plant growth. Um, aphid attack on cereals, another thing entirely the function of, well, sorry, not entirely, it's always more complicated, largely the function of the use of soluble nitrogen, which makes actually the sap and the cell walls of cereals much more attractive to aphids and much more vulnerable to aphid attack. So, um, and then of course, you know, you, you need, conventionally, you need all the soluble nitrogen, aphids attack, so you need 
fungicides, pesticides and so on to deal with the aphid attack. So it completely unbalances the system. So the, 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 the mechanisms in the way in which soil is released and nutrients released in the soil in an organic system or a low input system, low external input system, is very different to conventional systems. The effects of <coughs> microorganisms in the soil and the effect, Marx put down here, microorganisms <coughs> in mental health, I think, I think here he's referring to the whole thing about microflora in the, in the gut, influenced by soil. Taste is influenced again by the activity of soil, largely also coming back to the, the uh, issue of speed, of solubility of nutrients, the plant being forced to take it up. Uh, all has uh, a major impact. Now, that, none, of that is, none of that is contentious, really, as far as science is concerned, plant science and nutrition is concerned. This last bit, though, life force and energy, this is contentious. This is organic theory. This is organic theory in terms of health. It's about the idea of soil being a reservoir for um, vitality, a reservoir for energy a reservoir for the things that make for life. How that's transmitted is an open question. One school of thought believes that the, this transference of this, of this energy, this material, this quality, is through the activity of microorganisms, so, so, uh, so uh, fungi, that whole soil life uh, web, acting in a symbiotic relationship through plants with um, micro, microorganisms in the gut, beneficial or, or adverse bacteria in, in, the, in the gut. That's a kind of new science, but it's something that the organic pioneers have been talking about since well into the, since the 20s, 1920s. So this mechanism of life force is important. And the, therefore, what goes on in the soil and the mediation of soil activity, both chemical activity um, um, uh, physical activities, physical weathering and so on, and the activity of bacteria and a whole range of, range of microorganisms is critical in keeping the organic system moving. And it's about turnover. We put organic material into the soil in different forms, and there's different, we'll come to this in a second, depending on what you want to achieve, but we need an active, living, life soil. The more dead the soil is, the less air it is, the more constipated, if you like, it is, the less turnover of nutrients. And the, the, uh, the impact on productivity, the impact on balanced growth is, is, uh, is significant. So, um, how do we measure this? Do we need to measure it? What are we looking for? Um, then, of course, soil indications of healthy soil, we have the impacts in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the wider en environment. Whether water stays in the soil or whether it goes out um, carrying nutrients with it, uh, how um, volatilization happens at certain times of year, releasing uh, uh, nitrous oxide, ammonia, whatever, into the atmosphere, how we treat manures that go into the soil, and so on. Um, all of that, again, is to do with soil activities and landscape. Um, how we have a rotation, whether we uh, uh, rotate crops and cultivate crops in a way that brings on soil erosion, for example, makes, uh, makes the soil more vulnerable to soil erosion, either through air, or through um, uh, water, or, or through wind blowing. So the soil, as the anchor of plant roots and as the mechanism for holding back water flow is also critically important in considering what is a healthy soil. No, I'm not moving. Any help? 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 help. So 
tell you, I'll put a note somewhere and then we can just go to this with the, the, the uh, mm -hmm. Slides, no? No. No. <laughs> 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 or not good, I just want that to be. Maybe because we have two different versions of that same presentation. Yeah. Maybe the answer is because you can use this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, finally, cracked it. And the other notes. And the other notes. And amazingly, wow. <laughs> amazingly, all of that stuff, all of that stuff that I just said, which you might have thought was bullshit, actually turns out to be correct. <laughs> Staggering. Um, so we've done all that, soil health assessments, we haven't, we move on. So how do we assess soil in the field? And uh, the, um, generally, until, well, actually, generally most people just look at physical, um, physical measurements, um, things like the um, uh, physical and chemical analysis of soil. But the, what, what often people forget when they do is they look for chemical analysis, soil analysis, or whatever. But actually, it's just a farmer going out and smelling the soil, just walking, sticking a spade in, sticking a, a probe in, working out you know, whether there's uh, anaerobic um, uh, layers in the soil due to uh, compaction or due to uh, water retention, whatever. All of those kinds of things, which physically you can just actually go and do. You don't need to spend huge amounts of money on on chemical or physical soil, and that physical soil analysis you can do with, with sight, with smell, and with, with feel, touching the soil, whatever, um, moving it around. But then we have laboratory analysis, uh, the whole thing with um, soil micro and micro elements which you can test for in the laboratory, <coughs> and there's different, there's different methods. Um, Mark um, mentions here specifically the soil health, te health test by Cornell, and these are looking at the physical and the chemical and the biological measured by soil respiration, uh, respiration, soil protein, and active carbon, which is um, the way in which uh, it, it's not straightforward organic, simple organic matter. It's the movement of different fractions of carbon in the soil. It's, an, it's, it's a chemical analysis, and there's some physical, there's some uh, microbi uh, microbiological analysis, but it looks at the turnover of carbon on its way to becoming final product in the soil, which is humus. So you can measure those things, and this Cornell uh, system system does that. The um, uh, a system that was originally developed actually by Organic Research Center Soil Health Test, which is now run by NRM, it's a laboratory, does many of those same kinds of things, but it doesn't do soil carbon, and uh, doesn't do active carbon, and it doesn't do soil protein. Um, soil biology, relatively new, uh, measurements of by counting DNA. Um, the problem with this um, is what does it actually tell you because the system changes in terms of, uh, in, in terms of time of year, uh, weather, there's rapid fluctuation of biological activity in the soil dependent upon time of year, season and so on. So Personally, um, uh, Mark is far too kind about these kinds of things. He's very fair. I would say, mm, is it worth spending the money on? Um, but um, but you can do that. You can also these days get micro micro ariza analysis. <coughs> uh, Mark thinks this is a cheaper and uh, uh, and uh, uh, a reliable indicator. And I'll show some figures in a second about micro ariza being a proxy indicator for. Uh, soil microbiomass. The problem is that some of lots of these things, you can get a sample, and you can. What do you do with it once you find this? What what actually do you do, you do with it? Um, so you say, okay, this mycorrhizal level in my soil is 
is what it is. You can, what do you do? How do you increase it? Um, and what will it mean if you increase it? The control you've got over that is actually rather limited. Uh, what you can do is certainly destroy it. But we know about that. We know how these mi microbiological activities get destroyed. It's by inappropriate cultivation. It's about uh, allowing, uh, through allowing water, water logging. It's not by aeration and so on. So simple things that farmers know about in terms of basic soil management uh, heavily, inf heavily influence these micro mi microbacterial um, uh, assessments. Similarly, so whether you, again, whether you want to spend the money on it, and there are some outstanding people who come and give wonderful presentations, generally called Elaine Ingham. They're wonderful presentations, and it's great, you know, and everybody goes away wanting to buy, spend a fortune on all these things, but in reality, the basics, just the basics are fine, you know, because if you, you might have all these counts, but what, as a practical farmer, can you do about them? Other than what you will be doing for basic soil management anyway, cultivating at the right time. So uh, choosing the right time, avoiding compaction, all of those things, which are the critical things about soil life. <coughs> so Mark thinks soil protein and active carbon analysis might give a better indication of biological soil activity than uh, straightforward soil organic matter and respiration. And he says this, and he, I think he's absolutely correct, because of the way that uh, biological activity measurements and soil respiration measurements um, and soil protein and anything that turns over rapidly is so uh, changeable, rapid change uh, in terms of season, in terms of weather, rainfall and so on. So um, a more kind of uh, longer term um, uh, measurement or indication uh, it might be, might be of more interest in terms of value for money. So lots of things you can do in the lab to assess soil health. And really, when it comes down to it, it depends on you as a farmer, whether you want to spend money on this kind of stuff, whether it's um, a kind of life jacket, belt and braces stuff, or whether you're going to trust the basic, um, your basic sense. When it comes down to it, for an organic farmer, there's just simple rules. You don't actually need great soil analysis to tell you this. The pH has got to be within the, um, within the range for the kinds of crops that you're growing. And if you get the pH in the range of the kinds of crops that you're growing that you want, that's actually amazingly also a good pH level for <coughs> earthworms activities that you want to, want to, um, that you want to encourage. Compaction is a killer. It's, it's not a big deal, is it? I mean, it's just common sense. If you've got compacted soil, everything slows down. Do you really need a biological activity, uh, you know, a thing to know that you've got compaction in the field? I don't think so. You know where the wet spots are. You know where the spots that are difficult to plough are. And actually, you probably know what to do about it, which is things like, you know, um, deep cultivation with no till, no inversion and so on. So you know about those kinds of things. You probably need to know from a soil analysis just how low certain major nutrients are, like um, phosphorus. Um, but then, okay, you know about it, but actually amazingly, organic farms operate effectively at a much, much lower level uh, uh, indices level than conventional farms. And so, do you want to spend the money on rock phosphate when you're at an indices of one and all the advisors are telling you you've got to buy phosphate because indices of one you can't grow anything? Well, actually, lots of organic farmers do. And if you've got a low indices of potash, what the hell can you do about it anyway? Because there's nothing effective that you can buy. You've just got to get better at manure management and moving, uh, mo moving, um, um, moving cows maybe, or moving manure and compost around the farm. So you probably need to know that, just in terms of fields, just in terms of your plan for uh, nutrient supply around, around the fields. So you think, you know, do you want to spend money on lots of, um, lots of esoteric or kind of complicated tests when just basic stuff that's relatively cheap and observation and sight and smell and digging holes, you know, digging, uh, using the spade and digging and looking at the soil profile, maybe that's enough. But anyway, 
Uh, Mark's view is the all of these things, and really some are good, some are bad, is such sort of what you want. Um, so pay your money if you want. Um, the, um, some trial results in terms of um, impact of different farming systems on soil and on soil organic matter levels. Uh, this is the DOC or DOK trial was established in 1974 in the Swiss Federal Institute for the Swiss Institute for uh, <coughs> Research into Biological Husbandry or Organic Farming. I'm glad Hardy Bookman is not here to see me make a complete balls up of <coughs> these results because Hardy was the guy who started it, uh, this trial in 1974. It's still running. It's one of the longest, it is one of the longest trials that compared organic and conventional production. And it's always been um, a debate within the Institute as to whether or not it's worth it. Because it's expensive, this kind of comparative work is expensive. And at various times they think it is worth it or it's not. But um, a few years ago they brought all the results together from, I think, I think 30 years, 25 years, 30 years. And actually they looked at the results and they analysed the results and they had the results published in a very prestigious peer-reviewed journal. Um, and, and it's actually thrown up some, some rather interesting things. So D stands for dynamic, biodynamic. It's a biodynamic treatment. O is organic. And C, or if you're in German, it's K, is conventional. These are uh, plot trials, so they're not whole farms, they're plot trials. And if one was being hypercritical, you'd say actually they're fertilization trials. Um, because the most variable factor is the type of fertilization that's used on the different plots. But they are carefully matched to give um, statistical significance or not. So they're really proper trials properly assessed, random, proper in the conventional scientific terminology. And the uh, matched for year type of cultivation and rotations. Um, the, di major, the major difference, the major difference, as I said, is fertilization. So the, um, the, uh, uh, the biodynamic, well, we come to different treatments in a second. This is soil organic matter. Uh, trials over the period of the experiment from 1997 to 2012 and the um, the high intensity plots are the plots where you're they're, they're doing all the kind of right things speeding up the process aiming for productivity the um, differences so we've got conventional mineral fertilizer which is the yellow Conventional production with farmyard manure, uh, organic production, which is the blue line, and biodynamic, which is the green line. The other thing I should say is that this replicates um, or, or mimics, as far as they possible when they started, Swiss production. So Swiss conventional production is not anything like as intensive as our conventional production. So which which actually um, means that were we to do this kind of trial following the practice of intensive, intensive conventional agriculture, we would probably get different results. But nonetheless, there's some interesting things. And the interesting things here are actually <coughs> no great difference in these things. This is really not statistically significant. The big difference where there is a statistic significance is with the biodynamic treatments. The major difference in treatments to the biodynamic agriculture, one is they use the preparations. They haven't, the researchers didn't pull out what the preparations effect. The major obvious difference <coughs> is the constant use, always the use, of composted farmyard manure. Not farmyard manure by itself, but composted using biodynamic preparations. And that has produced a significant result. Uh, it's statistically significant. Not great, but it is clearly a result. The, um, 
the other aspect, other measurement, is on um, microbial biomass. And again, you have the, um, uh, this is the control, um, the manure plots, the biodynamic plots, and the, uh, and the um, sorry, the, the M is mineral, mineral fertilizer, conventional fertilizer, um, the manure plots, um, the uh, biodynamic plots, and the organic plots. The 100% is the, is the control. And again, you can see very clear benefits in terms of soil microbial biomass from the biodynamic plots. Less clear results, but nonetheless, in this case, clear results also in favor of organic. And the, the conventional, not so different from, from the control. So in terms of, whilst there's not significance necessarily uh, except for biodynamic in overall soil organic matter. In terms of microbial biomass, there is, a, there is a difference from the use of biodynamic preparations, use of organic, mainly probably to do with compost as opposed to specific farmyard manure. These are looking at, um, these are looking at the uh, indicators, again in terms of soil carbon, microbial biomass and mycorrhizae. And the, uh, these figures at the top, you, see, you can see big differences, but the figures at the top that are showing the statistical significance. The same figures are the same. Statistically the same, different figures are showing uh, statistical differences. Again, we've got the uh, control, conventional mineral, biodynamic, organic, and um, conventional with farmyard, farmyard manure. And this soil organic matter, the organic and the conventional with farm yard manure are not, really not showing any statistical difference. The real st statistical difference again is the biodynamic uh, on, on organic carbon and the conventional with, well there is a difference between the control and the conventional fertilizer. So in terms of organic carbon, again the fertilization regime is giving you more organic carbon because you're growing things as opposed to control. So you've got plant roots going in there and so on. So you're measuring uh, organic carbon, you're measuring carbon, uh, even though it's in a conventional system. And one of the things, by the way, years ago, and it's still claimed now for glyphosate, but standard conventional practice years ago was to use um, Gramoxo, which is an ICI um, product, uh, Paraquat. And that was the first introduction of zero till, no till. That you sprayed everything. The soil, when I first got into this arguing with, or discussing, sorry, discussing with conventional scientists and the organic matter and the meaning of this, they used to give these figures and show you, look, conventional arable systems is higher in organic matter than these organic systems and grassland systems. And they were all using this chromoxone mm -hmm. paraquat. They just sprayed it off. But it was there, it was being picked up in the analysis. It was analyzing as soil organic carbon. So they had high levels of organic carbon. It wasn't doing anything. Plants, the earthworms and microorganisms didn't want to go any, anywhere near the stuff. So it's not turning over, it's just like a dead mat. But that's measure coming up as high soil organic matter. So when people talk about carbon and organic matter, you really have to be careful and ask what the hell they're talking about. Microbial biomass is measuring the kind of breakdown process, the living soil. And here again, interesting, way ahead in terms of statistics is the biodynamic system uh, with, the, um, with the preparations and similarly on mycorrhiza. But there is, <coughs> the, um, again, the organic and the conventional with farm manure, very similar. But this is low intensity conventional using farm manure. Um, and I'm not sure why that statistics are a bit over the place. I need to really understand the notes to explain that. But again, you've got a very clear result in terms of mycorrhiza. Um, effect of biomass on yield. There is a, there is a result here, but um, I'm not really going to go and explain this because I'm not entirely sure I believe what I'm seeing. Um, the argument is that there is an effect of on biomass of yield. Now that would make kind of sense, but um, I, I uh, and it's at this end you, you kind of see 
these, you see these results. What I guess is, what I'm prepared to say at this point, without fully understanding, is, is that this middle bit, um, there's a great deal again of overlap between a low input, low intensity conventional system with the use of farm yard manure. And again, not overuse of farm yard manure, it's not a massive use of farm yard manure. Um, that, that kind of system is, is giving these, um, is, is, is giving a kind of overlap and a kind of gray, a gray area. Whereas at the other end of the scale, there is a kind of clear result. Um, again, another interesting one, because it speaks to the impact of soil suppressing plant diseases. And it's the lower ones that we want to look at in this case. So the how soil and what its state has on disease suppression in the plants. Again, we're looking very clear results. For the biodynamic, uh, for the biodynamic trials, <clears throat> a favourable result to a large extent. But again, the statistics mm, on on organic, because there's the errors in this. And if you can see these little bars here, where they overlap, it's indicating that the clear. There's no real clear statistical difference. And if you want, you can push this and say there is a difference, or you can actually be rather conservative and say there's no difference. But the real difference is very clear, again, for the, for the biodynamic treatments. Biodynamic treatments, just to reiterate, the use of preparation and the use of composted farmyard manure. So, um, in a way, what all that means is when you come to looking at these trials and these observations, you can really bury yourself in detail. And you think, actually, what does it mean? What really does all that mean in terms of the farming system? Other than we should all go biodynamic and use preparations for composted farming or carbon manure. But of course, again, it's not, that, it's not that simple. What this doesn't show is it shows a very Swiss system and reasonable uh, inputs doesn't show, for example, the fact that soluble nitrogen in the form of slurry is just as damaging to soil life as soluble nitrogen from fertilizer, from chemical fertilizer. So anything that comes in as an input is potentially disruptive. It's got potential benefits, but it's also potentially disruptive. And as is cultivations, it's the same. The um, when, how, what you use, and timing of cultivations disrupts soil life. The important thing in terms of what these results show and any results show is that the resilience of soil comes from increasing soil biomass and what is there in terms of carbon turnover to humus. Humus is this great buffer, this balancing act. And the goal of organic farming needs to be the build-up of, first of all, nutritive uh, organic material and humus that turns over, and then the creation of stable humus, which is all over time, because it's that that gives the buffer and makes, and makes things resilient. So when you go in and fuck up the cultivations, because you've done it at the wrong time and you kill off all the earthworms, actually, if you've got a resilient soil, and you're not killing the earthworms off by glyphosate or some other toxic um, pesticide, those earthworms and that soil life will fairly rapidly come back if you've got this buffer, this resilience, which is built in the soil microbial biomass and humus levels. These are all the things Mark suggests, and I completely agree with him, in terms of building up resilience in the soil, soil microbial biomass and, and humus. Good structure, proper drainage. Reduced tillage, not min-till, not no-till. Sensible tillage, reduced tillage. There's no real evidence, by the way, that min-till or, 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 or zero tillage are any better for soil, than, uh, for soil life than, for, than, uh, than sensible, um, reason, reasonable cultivations at the right time, even involving uh, inversion. But non-inversion is better. And we, lots of people confuse min-till with and zero till with non-inversion tillage 
Aeration in the soil is a good thing. You can't get aeration in the soil without proper non-inversion cultivation. So don't get cut. Good crop rotation with crop diversity because that's giving different root, different root types, different root depths. That's opening up the soil and feeds soil life in different ways. Conti use of cover crops for protection of the soil with continual ground cover and use of green manures in that way. There's a, there's a quid pro quo though, it's not all clear because in an organic system sometimes these things don't die, they become weed problems. And we, we, we had an amazing, years ago, a big thing about bringing techniques over from Germany, lots of green manures. And the Germans would say, oh, this, you've got to use this, got to use this, it's great, get killed off in the frost. We don't have frost. We have biological activity in the soil almost every day of the year. In, in the Germany, those are things changing now, but it, this, things stopped, things got killed. So you could use green manure covers in a different way in Germany than we could here. We had to learn that. So anyway, but maintenance of cover, obviously use of um, legumes in the rotation. Efficient use of livestock manures is as critical in terms of planning. Leaving aside the idea that of energy and vitality being spread in livestock manures, livestock manures properly used, properly planned, and properly treated, composted, aerated, slurry, whatever, in the right amounts, is the way to transfer P and K around the organic system, particularly potash. If you've got a deficit there, you've got to move it around. Compost, great. The pH, may, that's, this is critical, maintaining pH in, in this range. And just another aside here, when people say we work with nature and we copy nature, actually we don't. No natural systems wants pH in this level. What natural systems try and do is push down that because wildflowers, all of that kind of stuff, operate at lower levels of pH than most of the crops we want to, we, we, we want to, uh, we want to produce. If we have lower pHs, we slow down the productive cycle. It's a balance, checks and balances. There's no right way or wrong way here. It depends on what you want to do. Um, mineral fertilizer, I think he's referring here to, to, uh, to rock dust for phosphate and so on. Use of soil amendments and inoculants. Mark's, Mark's, Mark is okay. Mark is happy using inoculants for rhizobia and stuff like that. I'm more skeptical about it, but it's his presentation, so these are great. Um, and obviously, avoid agrochemicals. Um, that was really a kind of thing in terms of observing. The soil is the thing that most that's common to farmers, whether you're a livestock farmer, conventional, or, or a livestock farmer, or arable farmer, or a grower. Soil is the common thing, which is why we wanted to do this presentation about observations and how you can observe and manage the system. You can make it incredibly complicated. You can buy lots of stuff that snake oil salesmen or other people <laughs> sell you. You can do all of that. You can buy all the tests, whatever, or you can do it just basics. And you can get the same results because it's actually what you do in the field in terms of uh, the basic simple stuff. So, thank you.